Welcome to the IG Race Timing 101 video, kind of an introduction to the program. By the time this video is done, hopefully you understand the, the flow of the program and how it's laid out, why it's laid out the way it is, and basically how to get started, uh, really just teaching yourself. Um, so there's a lot of things I want to make sure that we cover in this video that, um, and the reason why I'm creating is, is because there's enough users now, I think there's about 400 users across 37, 38 countries. Uh, that are using it, and this is with basically you know no marketing. Uh, it's just people looking for a system with no yearly fees and something easy to use, um, and that's the reason why I designed it. Um, and so it's been very popular. Uh, I've heard from, of course, a lot of people that have come from basically every system out there over to mine, uh, whether it be because of cost or ease of use or whatever. But uh, the biggest compliments they say, man, this thing is is uh, provides everything I need. It's, it's awesome, but it's easy to use, and so that's my goal. Um, but the, the thing is, there's lots of things with anything new. Um, you know, with race timing, you've got hundreds of people that are depending on you. So you need to make sure you know how to use it um, the way it's designed and, and the way that makes you look good on race day. So what we're going to do is we're going to dig through a lot of the uh, most common questions I get. And, um, you know, like, again, hopefully by the time this video is done, uh, you know the proper way to do certain tasks that, um, you know, there, there's some task in the program, there's two, three ways to do it. And obviously I want to teach you the easiest way, the way it's, uh, things are quick and, and uh, dependable. So let's go ahead and dig into the program. You uh, will see the icon here. You can open it up and you'll see a menu bar top uh, pop up from the top of the screen there. And you've got the option to simply create a race. And there's many options in here. You can pull a uh, create a race from a file. It, it can be any kind of delimited file. So if this came from uh, athletic.net or some other website, um, then you can create it, uh, it from that one file. It'll create all your races, pull all the athletes in, do all kinds of stuff. So um, you can also pull the uh, the race in from Run Sign Up. So if you get hired to time a race and the race says, "Hey, my race is already on Race Roster or Run Sign Up," and and I'll you know probably continue to add to this list um, uh, as time goes by. But uh, now, of course, if you are using, um, if they're using a, a, a race online or any other website. Uh, every online registration site will have an option to download a file. So, you know, obviously, that's how you have to you have to get those participants somehow uh, to the timer. So every website will have an option to download a file, and I've made it to where uh, the software can import any kind of file. Doesn't matter what kind of it is, how it's formatted. You can do all your formatting from inside the program. Um, and we may open that up and dig into that in a second. But in this video, I'm going to try to cover not you know not a full training session. I've got other videos that do that, but this video is more of a 101 you know 101 sessions kind of getting started with the program. So to create races, this is obviously where you go, create race. Um, to uh, view races in your system, uh, you'll come in here. Um, I'll dig a little bit into uh, how this looks based on if races are started or not. And um, But this is where you go to open up races. Um, obviously, the email screen, this is where you can go and send out mass uh, uh, email announcements. So I can come over here and say, well, uh, it's a week before the race. I'm going to send out maybe my pre-race announcements, you know, hey, here, this is how you wear the tags. You know, we want to, we want you to return them so it keeps our cost down, keeps the tags out of the landfill. And, you know, after the race, if you need to leave, you'll get an email with results and photos and videos. And, you know, I may send a, a pre-race announcement out or, of course, after the race. If the race, if this race has been started, there'll be another checkbox here that's checked automatically that says include personalized results. So I may say th um, something like, you know, thank you for supporting this race and, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, here's your uh, results link or whatever. Um, and so there's all kinds of neat things you can do here. All right. Um, and then, of course, here's the help menu. The biggest thing I would say in here is that uh, you want to join the user's form. Uh, this is something now, uh, basically this software is something I designed simply because I didn't want to hire timers and I couldn't find anything that was easy to use and either free or didn't have yearly fees. And so that's kind of why I built this system. Um, uh, so the problem is, though, it, this is a one-man show, basically. And I've got people that, uh, Jamie Chandler, she manages all the hardware sales. Absolutely amazing at what she does. Um, and so, uh, and I've got, of course, uh, a head timer and I've got timing crews. So I'm not I'm not tied up every weekend because uh, if, if I was doing that, I wouldn't be married anymore. My wife would leave me, I think. But um, So I try to focus only on the software. Um, but, of course, uh, you know, usually two weekends out of the month, I'm out there timing. So, I mean, this is something I built this with the goal of, uh, you know, if, if there's a bug reported, I fix it immediately because guess what? I don't want to suffer from that bug. And so uh, this is something I think you'll find is a pretty solid system. It's uh, used heavily. Um, and, again, when I'm out there timing, not only am I 
uh, making sure there's no bugs. But I'm also looking for any way I can perfect it and make it better because not just for my benefit, but you know, when I'm sending my crews out, I want this to be as easy to use as possible for them. And so um, the, the point is uh, there's roughly 400 or so users now. And uh, it's, you know, this is something I have to support myself, which is, again, uh, um, another, another reason why I try to make it as easy as possible to use and as dependable as possible. But uh, there are times where, you know, it's a busy spring season or fall season or, you know, my office job, I have to go out of town for uh, a week. In fact, I'm in Mississippi this week. Um, there's some times where I struggle to keep up with emails. And so uh, if, if, uh, if you need help, of course, email me, call me. Um, but you can also post a, a message on the users forum. I feel like I've got the best users. I mean, amazing guys that are out there. I uh, really appreciate everyone kind of helping each other. Um, and there's some very experienced, I mean, of course, people from all walks of life. So if you've got like a, some kind of networking problem, there's, there's network professionals that are, uh, some of my users that are on there can help you out. So I really love those guys. In fact, kind of what I tell people is, Hey, you know, I don't charge yearly fees, but one way you can kind of pay me back is to help other people. So, you know, jump on the forum. If you see someone that's got a problem you can help with, you know, please help them out. And then of course, always keep it respectful and friendly. Uh, that's the thing I'm most proud of is that everyone is very friendly there. So, uh, kudos to you guys. But, um, all right. So the users form is here under the help menu, uh, and then the settings screen. Now we'll dig into this in a little bit. Um, so if you have just installed the program, uh, some of the things I recommend doing first is if you go to the users form, which again, you can access from here uh, and any, anybody can read anything on the users form, um, but you can't post unless you join. Uh, and of course, basically, if you join, I'll accept you as long as um, you kind of post a reason why you're joining. If, if, uh, if I get spam, usually they don't even include any notes in there why they're trying to join. Um, and so uh, it, it's, it's a pretty open system. But if you join the users form or access the users form, there's two posts I'd recommend you reading if you're new. Uh, so one of them is the tips for initial system setup. So if you have a laptop, uh, here's kind of my ideas. What we don't want on race day is surprises. You know, the race director doesn't want surprises and you don't want surprises. And for sure, you don't want surprises with your computer. You don't want Windows uh, 10 to do an update or, you know, any uh, uh, antivirus to try to to block access to the reader on race day or who, you know, do something weird. And so this is kind of my tips um, on how you should set up your PC. Uh, for example, you want to make it to where closing the lid of your laptop doesn't put your computer to sleep because you sure would hate for, you know, to be moving stuff around on your timing desk and the lid close uh, just enough or, or accidentally close to where um, your timing system's down. And so there's all kinds of tips in here on, on how, uh, how to ensure that your PC is uh, designed and ready for race timing. Um, and so that's one post I'd recommend you reading. Uh, number two, and probably the, maybe even the most important post if you're going to do chip timing, is uh, here's some some thoughts that um, I posted. This is well, a couple years ago. Uh, on basically, I'm trying to teach people how UHF RFID works. I get all kinds of questions from people saying, "Hey, do you think this antenna will work? Or what about that reader?" Really, the the uh, UHF is pretty awesome. I mean, almost any type of reader works great. Uh, you know, the tags, they're great. Everything's great. It's its all about understanding how UHF works. There are some nuances there. For example, I can read through 20 feet of concrete like it's not even there. However, if I cover the tag with my pinky finger, it can't even see it. Or if I take a wet paper towel and uh, put it between the tag and the antenna, it can't see it. Um, and so it's one of those things you kind of have to understand UHF RFID uh, before you actually go out and try to, you know, do it for a paid race. And so one of the biggest uh, problems I see is that uh, people go into it with the same thing I did, which is, hey, I'm going to throw a tag on the bib because that's the most convenient for the runners, and people are going to love me, and everything's going to be great. Well, the problem is uh, bib tags, as you see here, if you've got your antennas pointing straight down or reading directly across the finish line, which is how I have mine set up, uh, but I don't use bib tags. Um, but if you have that set up, the tag is coming across at a 90-degree angle, which you see here is 90 degrees. And that, what that means is there's almost no power getting to the tag at all. Uh, what I tell people is imagine that you've got a piece of paper with a barcode printed on it and you're trying to read it, but that paper is not edged to your eyes. Well, you, you can't you can't see the barcode. You can barely see the paper. Well, it's the same concept. The antenna, um, the RFID antenna is shooting power out to that tag and the tag is getting almost no power. So it can't respond back saying, hey, here's my EPC um, or, you know, the bib number or whatever. And so the biggest thing with with setting up tags and antennas and getting, you know, what you want on race day is 100% read rate reliably. Now, there's going to be times where just for some crazy reason, whether the tag is programmed wrong or 
Uh, of course, you'll see some people that just didn't even wear their tag, and uh, you hunt, you know, you go chase them down in the finish line and say, "Oh, I didn't care about my time. I left my tags in the car." Uh, you know, it's always frustrating, but th- that happens. And to me, I don't consider that a miss because there was no tag to miss. I didn't wear them, but th- there will be a time where, um, you know, even with the perfect setup, it's possible that a tag is missed for some reason. Now, you'll find that when the tag is directly facing antenna, that's extremely rare. I mean, extremely rare. Um, but with bib tags. You know, you're, you're trying to read tags at an angle and it's on the wettest part of the body because obviously when you sweat it goes straight down your chest and your back um it's the thickest part of the body but the, the number one culprit though is angle uh so make sure that your tag uh comes across as much as possible directly facing the antenna which is a zero degree or 180 because you know the tag is just a flat piece of paper so no matter you know which there's no front or back basically so this is kind of why this is shaped like this this is 90 degree and this is directly facing. You see that it gets the most power if it's directly facing. And so uh, that's why for me, uh, I wanted to have a tag design. I never intended to make my own tags. But after uh, slapping a few on a, on a few bibs, it hit me. It's like, wait a minute. Every time I time a race, I have to hope I have enough tags because I'm I'm burning through tags like crazy. If I, I time a race 300 people, that's 300 tags I've lost. Um, and so I have to buy more all the time. And so you know, my intention after a, a, you know, a week or two of testing was I want to find a way where that tag is reliably 100%. Um, because what I found is I can flick a tag in front of the antenna as fast as you possibly can, and it picks it up every time. But I can put a tag on my bib and run through, you know, four or five antennas, and sometimes it miss, you know, sometimes misses uh, misses me completely. And it was rare, but it happens sometimes. And so um, after some testing, I found that you know when that tag is on my hip or my shoe or some way where it's directly facing the antenna. It's on the driest part of the body. It's on the thinnest part of the body, uh, and it's directly facing. And I can also reuse the tag, so my cost is the lowest. Um, then that's the reason why I design the tags I do. Um, and so that's that's my recommendation, uh, especially if you're a new timer or new to UHF. Put it on a um, on the hip or on the shoe. You know, get to where you're used to getting 100, percent and then start experimenting with bib tags, um, um, because it's one of those things. It's if you if you know what you're doing, bib tags work fine. Yeah, I, I would say they're probably not reliably 100. percent you have a lot of races where you do get 100, but uh, it's, it's not reliably 100%. Um, but it works well enough, and there's some some people that say, look, I'm going to use bib tags. That's, that's what people are used to in my area. I understand that. Um, but anyways, I would recommend starting off with shoe or hip tags. Uh, but before you do anything, of course, I would recommend getting the system, inviting the neighborhood kids over, invite the running club over, your running buddies, and tell them, hey, look, we're going to try to break this system. You know, buy some pizza, invite people over. And you know, set up the system in your backyard, and then flood twenty people by as fast as you can. See what works, see what doesn't. Um, so, anyways, I will get off of that horse there, and let's move on to the actual program. So, I made a list here of things that we're going to cover real fast. Uh, so, number one is updating the software. So, sometimes uh, someone will download the software, and I'll give them a temporary key because yeah, I never want someone to pay for the software until. Uh, they know for sure, hey, man, this this thing meets my needs and my expectations. This thing's great. I want to use it because I don't want someone buying the software and then they try to use it for something that wasn't designed for, which it can handle just about any type of race and it's used for all types of races. But I don't want someone buying it and then, then they uh, are very demanding on me. Like, hey, I need you to change this. You need to change that. And so I'd rather someone not buy it until they find out, hey, man, this thing meets my needs. And so I'm more than happy to provide a key that turns you know full access onto the software for for a few months or however long you need, as long as I don't feel like I'm being taken advantage of, of course. Um, so let's say that you, um, I push a patch out and you need to update the software. If you're running a temporary key um, or a manual version, you'll see that this button is enabled. And this is simply to upgrade your software from either the trial version to the manual version or from the manual version to RFID. This is not where you go to update the software. This is where you upgrade your soft- software. Basically, you're paying for the higher edition. And uh, um, th- you know, so that's the button you click there. But if you want to update your software, uh, all you have to do is go to my website. Now I push out patches. Uh, you know, anytime anyone finds anything, uh, it, especially if it's a bug, I try to fix that immediately because again, I don't want that bug on you know, when I go to right time races. And with as many customers as I have, if there's a bug out there, uh, you know, I don't want to be hammered with tech support. So I try to fix it real quick and, and get it out. But it, so if I push a patch out. Um, you'll see it in two things. Number one, I usually report it on the uh, users group page saying, hey, I pushed this out just so you're aware, and I say what it includes. Uh, but you can also go to uh, my website and click on the race timing system side, and you'll see here it says last updated, and then there's the date and time of when I push the update out. 
Um, if you see that a new update's available, you just click on the free trial button. It downloads the uh, installer and you run it. Uh, if you already have the program installed, all it does is simply update the software and that's it. So that's what is uh, involved in getting updates. All right. Um, so next thing is, uh, let me delete that off my list so I don't cover that again. Um, so a common question is, what if you're timing two races that may or may not overlap or that start at the same time? So what I did is I pulled in the races I timed last weekend, and uh, this one's a triathlon. We had, uh, what, seven waves or so. Um, and so this is kind of kind of going to simulate, simulate um, like if you had a 10K, a half marathon, 5K, and, you know, they, it seems like races nowadays, they want to have as many events as possible. You know, even a 5K is like, oh, we're going to have a one-mile fun run too. Uh, 10K is like, oh, let's do, you know, let's throw on everything. And so that's very common to time uh, multiple races at the same time. So the system handles that. Uh, I would, I, yeah, I think it's just as easy to time um, three races as it, as it is a time one race in the system. Um, and so uh, you know, we're getting, we're, we can dig in, into uh, the actual registration part in a second to see how to move people from one race to another. It's very easy. In fact, I'll go ahead and show you that. You just double click on the name and change the race. Uh, so very simple. Uh, but let's say that the um, uh, we're going to start. Let's say that the meet director for this, maybe it's a cross country meet, says, "Hey, we're going to do the JV boys and the varsity boys at the same time, and then after after they're done, then we'll do the uh, JV girls and varsity girls or whatever." Um, and so basically, what you want to do is you can open up any race; doesn't matter. The software knows which races you have going on um, for the same day as the race you opened, and so it pulls them all in. So it doesn't matter which race you select, you click on time race, and it gives you the option to pull in whatever races you want into the clock screen. So let's say I pull in these four races, and you'll see that those four races appear in the top left. If I had only pulled in one race, you won't see this because the, the clock is only going to be for that one race only. But here, I can check off and say, let's say these two races start at the same time. So on your mark, get set, go. And let's say the meet director walks over and says, hey, I'm going to go ahead and get the uh, the other team lined up or the other race lined up, uh, um, and he, and I'll say, uh, what I'll tell him is, okay, just let me know when you're ready. And I can click on that race, and when he says, okay, we're ready to go, on your mark, set, go. So what we have here is you simply click on the race, and I, I should have, I meant to check off just that one. Um, let me actually reset that. Uh, I told you wrong. So I'm pressing F2. All, everything you're seeing here, the guide tab will show you. So F2 restarts the race. And you, uh, you have to restart each one, because I don't want you to accidentally over, uh, lose your results. So let me do this again. And the program is going to ask you twice when you reset the race because if you re reset the race pressing F2, you lose all results. So you never want to press F2 if you've got results you want to keep. Um, the common question I get though is, well, how do you stop the clock? Well, think of it like the light in your refrigerator. When you when you press the space bar, I'm going to start only this race this time. When you press the space bar, the system simply stores a date time stamp of when that race started. What you see here is simply a label that is constantly updated showing you the difference between when that race started and this clock right here. So when you are done timing, simply close out the clock. And even if you had 10 races pulled into there, there's nothing that, run that runs in the background. Now, if your computer were to completely die in the middle of the race or if you pulled up this race the next day, you will see, I'm going to go and pull all races in, you'll see that the clock is right where it was like it never, like you never close a clock screen. Uh, again, that's simply because when you pull this up, it's showing you the difference between when this race started and now, which is always moving forward. So in fact, if I were to change my Windows date time here, you would actually see this clock change because it's just showing you the difference between the two. So there is no stop clock button because there's no such thing as stopping a clock. The race has either been started or it has not. Um, Again, there's nothing running in the background, so it doesn't hurt anything. You just simply close the clock screen when you're done. If you realize tomorrow that you need to put a new entry in, well, then pull up the clock screen, hit the space bar you know, to add a new time, and then adjust it to wherever you need, and there you go. Um, I got a little sidetracked here. We're talking about starting multiple races, so let's get back on that. So we see here I've got a race that started about a minute and 17 seconds ago. Let's say that the meet director comes over and says, hey, we're going to start the, uh, the next two races. Of course, I can expand this out, see which one it is. Let's say he says we're going to start the, um, uh, the sprint races. So I'm going to check all those off. And you'll see as I select each one, it's showing me the clock for that race. So I can click over there. There's that clock. I can click over here. Here's those. Now, if I turn the readers on, 
this will continue to read tags and time the race and do everything like normal. Uh, um, you know, uh, there's no problem with showing zeros here. It will time the race. Um, and, you know, if someone finished right now, even though I had this race selected, it would show a minute 53 or whatever the clock time was for that race. The software, of course, will take the tag and it knows what race it belongs to. So you'll see the correct finishing time here. Um, but anyways, let's go ahead and start these next three races. You simply say on your mark, set, go, and there they go. So there's those races. And again, I can click on them and you'll see there's that clock and here's this clock. Now, whenever I select a race, um, you'll also see at the very top, it, it, it changes that clock too. So if I need to adjust this clock, let's say that I'm going to say, well, this race actually started, you know, 10 seconds before the other one. So I can adjust that up by 10 seconds. Um, and now that race has a slightly different clock than the other ones. So if you need um, to, let's say, because I had a guy a week or two ago said that he started two races at the same time, um, but he started it with his stopwatch, which I do that a lot too. I will walk over to the starting line. Instead of carrying my laptop, I just simply carry a stopwatch or use my wristwatch or whatever or my phone. And when they say on your mark, set, go, I simply you know start my stopwatch. And then I walk over to my computer and I will start the races and simply sync them up with my stopwatch. So let's say my stopwatch says three minutes and 12 seconds. Well, I'll bump it up. And you know, say by now it says 3, 15, 16, 17. And so I simply sync it up, hit save, and now that clock is perfectly in line with my stopwatch, which means it's just like I have my laptop there at the starting line. Um, and you'll see here, uh, like I said, each clock is separate, but um, whenever I read tags in a second, you'll see that the correct times show in the, in the actual timing screen. So the key concept here is that each race here, you can start anytime you want to, uh, I can start multiple races at the same time, uh, or just one at a time. Uh, now, one thing I should have mentioned before is if you got everything unchecked, and I hit the space bar right now, it'll start all the races that are unchecked. So checking all the races off or leaving me all unchecked does the exact same thing. You really only, only want to do the checkbox, um, or only need to do the checkbox when you're starting just one, uh, or you know, you're not starting all the races at the same time. So um, so now I'm going to start just this race. Here we go. On your mark, set, go. And there, that one's taken off. And so uh, the example I can give you, we time a kid's triathlon every year, and it has about 18 waves. We actually pull all the waves in here. And, and the way they do it is they simply, um, the reason why it's got so many waves is because the swimming pool they use only has like six lanes. And so they will start a, little, a wave of six kids. And as soon as they get out of the pool, they line up the next kids. Okay, on your mark, set, go. And so... What we do is uh, we get the uh, now we print off a roster for which kids are going to start in which wave and you know the uh, the starter has that list and lines them all up and then whenever he starts the watch uh, or sorry the race we start a stopwatch you know that uh, we have a timer that runs that sheet down to us or of course you could call us on the cell phone and say hey that was the uh, you know the the boys seven to nine years old um, you know heat or wave one or wave three and we simply select it and then um, start it up. And then we will sync it up with his stopwatch because he started it. And uh, now we're ready to go. And then we give him the thumbs up saying, hey, we're ready for the next race. And we simply get all of our clocks started whenever that wave starts. And that's it. And when people finish, um, you know, the system's reading and it does everything. And since the clocks are right, all the times are right. So um, one thing I wanted to point out, too, is let's say that – and I'll actually pull in another race for this example. Let's say that you completely missed the start of the race. So – and this actually happened to me um, – uh, I don't know, four or five years ago, where the race director actually started the race about seven minutes earlier than she was supposed to. And so the starting line was about three blocks away. And I guess about 15 minutes or so before the race, she started walking that way to the starting line. And I don't know if she didn't have a watch. I don't know. But I guess she got there um, at the start and people already lined up. And next thing I know, I'm, I'm actually still registering people at the registration area. And we had a couple people standing in line waiting to register, you know, filling out the form and, and about to pay. And all of a sudden the police siren goes off. And now this was a race I showed up kind of as a last minute favor because our timer backed out. And um, so I was just there by myself. I didn't have anyone at the stop uh, at the starting line. I've learned now, of course, to find a volunteer and give them a stopwatch and say, hey, if for some reason I'm not there, you, you know, you go ahead and start it. But the, the key is if you completely miss the start, there's no reason to panic. Um, all you have to do is uh, make sure that you start the clock and turn your readers on well before the first finisher gets there. And so, in fact, I got a tag that's close here. Let me get it out of the way. And so let's say that uh, um, what you're doing, by the way, is you're watching for a finisher to capture their own time. As you know, in most races, you know, the early, uh, the first few finishers are usually, you know, people that can train pretty hard and compete pretty hard. And they usually carry their own stopwatch and, you know, capture the time when they finish. And so let's say that some people have finished 
Uh, let me weigh some tags around here. And let's say that you discover, okay, well, this Holly, she captured her own time when she finished. So again, pay no attention to the actual clock time because it's way off. You have no idea what time it started. All you do is you walk over and say, hey, what time did you get? And if she says, oh, I ran at 18, 12. Um, and again, you can continue uh, capturing times while, while she does that. But our goal now is to make her time be 18, 12. So you can do that by adjusting the clock. And the moment you adjust that clock to where her time shows 18, 12, then you'll see that your clock time is exactly where it should be, just like you were at the start, and all other times are, are corrected. So you can be adjusting your clock and still have people finishing. And you'll see that the system... Um, so I need to go one more second back. And so you'll see that the system... Uh, so now the clock is exactly where it should have been, just like you were at the starting line, no big deal. Now, of course, you know you may be thinking to yourself right now, well, what happens if nobody captures the time? Well, I guess if that's the case, you just take your best guess and no one will know. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of halfway joking about that, of course, but if no one captures the time, I mean, you're kind of stuck with no other options. And so, um, uh, but you're going to find, of course, one person, even if, it's the, even if it's the very last person in the race that captured their own time. Um, so anyways, that's uh, another quick tip that a lot of people don't know about that you can do. Um, I'll, I'll say another thing. Let's say that this person came over, Sam, uh, and says, oh, no, me and my daughter wore uh, the wrong bibs and we didn't realize it. And now, by the way, I highly recommend that you use the bit, the tag check feature, which we'll look at in a little while. Um, but let's say that these two people were the wrong bib numbers. You simply highlight them, and then you can right-click and do swap bib numbers. And so if I click on this, then it should show Chase, Tracy and Sam have swapped. And so there we go. And now we got Tracy and um, Sam um, in the different time spots that they're supposed to be in. So that's another quick tip that a lot of people don't know about. Uh, again, I put all this stuff in there. Um, there's almost anything that happens I've put, you know, I've dealt with. And so I've put in a way to easily fix stuff. Um, so another cool little thing there. All right. Uh, now, by the way, you may be wondering, why are these in yellow? So if you're timing a cross country race, it's very important, uh, the finish order. And so now you're not usually going to have this many, you know, 17 people crossing within a second or two of each other. Now, you know, of course some races you could, but you know, your average race, you're not going to have that many. Um, and so that yellow represents that those are, that's a really close finish. And so if you wanted to know which records you need to review, again, primarily for cross-country races where the actual finish order is, is more important than the actual time, um, then that yellow simply represents, hey, there's someone with a, within a half a second, uh, or with I can't remember if it's half a second or a little before or a little after, I can't remember. But there's someone that's a really close finisher, so you may need to review this. Um, so that's all that means. There's nothing um, wrong there. Um, you also see if you manually capture a time or if you put in a bib number that doesn't belong to anyone, um, then uh, it'll show up in red. And that simply means, hey, this is a time that's going to be uh, ignored um, because it doesn't go with anybody in the system. So, for example, you see here I've got no um, no bib numbers that show 66. Um, so that's what red means. Now I can come over here and let's say I just transpose a number and I type in uh, 263. You know, I can make my correction and there they are. Um, so if you ever see someone go by and they didn't, you know, let's say they didn't wear a chip, but they have a bib on, so you know, they're in the race, you know, just hit the space bar, capture a time. Now, of course, by the time you notice that their time is probably going to be a few seconds off because, you know, they ran through the finish line before you actually capture the time. So in this case, if you see, uh, you know, Hey, that was bib number 265. Then of course you can adjust their time back. Let's say, let's say you adjust it back by seven seconds. Um, and it was 265 and there you go. Um, now there's obviously you want to have, I usually have two computers on my finish line, one doing chip timing and one doing manual timing. And that way I can easily peek over and see what that time was. And I don't have to guess. Um, and you also want to have someone at the end of your shoot with a bib member sheet, which you can print from the software and their job is to, and again, they want to be at the end of the shoot. They want to, they have a tendency if you're a race day volunteer, they have a tendency to try to get right near the finish line, but you want to keep telling them, Hey, stay back because we want people walking by the time they get to you. That way you can easily see their number and write it down. Now, if you're timing a big race where it's you know difficult to look up and look down, look up, look down, you know, keep running your writing numbers, then of course have someone stand next to them and their only job is to call out numbers so that the person writing down never has to look up. Um, but anyways, the uh, um, there's lots of cool things you can do in here. Of course, I can uh, DNS someone or DQ them. If, uh, if I saw, for example, this person is registered as a walker, but they sprinted through the finish line. I mean, there's all kinds of things you do here. You know, of course, the, the, the another thing you could do uh, is you can actually minimize the clock. So let's say that instead of DQing, I mean, you're just going to say, well, Casey Foster, um, let's see, um, I'm going to just swap them from a 
a walker to a runner. And so, um, so there's different things you can do there. And if you click on time race, it simply pulls back up the clock screen. Now, uh, if you make a change like that, you'd have to press F5 to refresh it. Um, and now it's actually actually saved in the database. So, I mean, if you printed the results without refreshing, it would show him as a walker or sorry, runner. Uh, so the F5 simply, if you wanted to get a refresh view of the screen here. Um, and so, um, let's see what other options we have in here. Uh, so let's say that Casey walks up and says, Hey, how did I do? Because a common question as a timer that you get, um, it, and, and I, I kind of halfway joking about this, you really don't want to advertise you can do this. So you know, you almost want to act like you're doing them a favor because you don't want them sending, Hey, yeah, if you want time to go over and see that guy, you know, of course you know, you're trying to, you're, you're trying to time a race, you're busy. And so, um, but you know, it's inevitable at every race, you're going to have someone walk up and say, Hey, can you tell me how my son Billy did? Uh, or, Hey, I've got to leave early. Can you tell me how I did my division? Um, you know, of course, a lot of people just, they want to know, you know, if I didn't win anything, I'm leaving, I'm out of here. Um, and so let's say that uh, someone walks up and say, hey, how'd I do? You can type in their bib number, or uh, if you don't know their, or if they don't know their bib number, you can say, well, what's your name? And you can type in any part of their name. So let's say I put H-O-L, and then here's all the names where uh, H-O-L is either in the first name or last name. So any part of their name, you simply type it in. Now, of course, you know, I'm typing in small stuff. If I typed in, I uh, say Nick, uh, then it will find the person um if there's only got one result it'll find them let's say i type in uh sam and now it looks like i got a handful of sam let me type in a uh, holly maybe that's only got one okay well anyways if it's got more than one you simply double click on their name and let's actually do holly sal because she's finished uh if i double click on someone that's finished then there's their performance so she got fifth out of 274 she's fourth in her division um and this is her time and this is her pace and speed so um, so the quick results is a way to kind of get people off your back quickly. Um, that's a lot better than ha having to try to hunt them down through the results because obviously this could be really long and you're scrolling around trying to find them. Uh, you know, our uh, this program, you can click on a column and it'll sort ascending or descending on any column you click on. Um, let's see here. There we go. Uh, or bib number. But, you know, this can be difficult to find someone's name in here. So it's better just to go to the quick results. Hey, what was your name? Okay. Um, Cassie. Uh, and then there you go. So uh, another quick tip, another thing. And, and let's say that the race director walks up to you. Let me go and scan some more tags so we can get as many results in here as we can. Um, let me see if I've got some more here. Okay. So let's say that we've got this number of finishers in and the race director says, hey, uh, can I go ahead and give out awards? Uh, you know, you, when you're waiting on the walkers at the end, um, you know, it, you want to know exactly at what point can you print off the division results and know that the next finishers coming in are, you know, are not going to affect those results. Uh, so if you are curious of that, you can always come over here to the award status, click on check award status. And if you see that everything is green, that means that you have enough finishers to, uh, to go ahead and give out the awards. And so um, this will take into account, uh, let's say that you've got no participants that are male 11 to 19, uh, then it'll just turn that green showing, hey, this one is ready. Basically, there's you're not waiting on anybody. And so basically, if you see all green, that means it's safe to um, to print that uh, print the division award, awards and go ahead and give out the awards. Um, while we're on this screen, I want to also want to show you that the uh, scan DNS tag. So this is something that um, half the time I get time to do it, and half the time I don't. I try to do it if I can when there's a break in the action or if, you know, if I got time before the first finishers come in. Um, and so what I do is I will start the clock and then I will take all the bibs and tags that were not picked up, um, because, you know, you're going to have a good 15 to 20% or more, uh, people that registered, but then they just never showed up for the race. And so I take all those bibs and tags that were uh, for the pre-registered athletes that were not picked up and I will use a scan DNS tag feature. Now, actually I have to turn the readers on before I can use it. Um, so let me do that and I'm going to say scan DNS tag. And so now while this dialog box is up right here. Um, you can scan all your tags that were not picked up, and you'll see that it's doing this uh, DNS athlete count. It now shows nine. If I scan another one, it shows ten. And so um, the moment I hit OK on here, now by the way, you want to make sure your tags are clear. Uh, you know those pre-registered tags are clear. Um, and when I hit OK, you'll see that it automatically marks all these athletes as did not start. Now, if one of these people do come through the finish line, it will still capture their time. It doesn't ignore them. And you can decide if that was just a rogue read of one of those tags that shouldn't, you know, should be ignored. You can just leave it there, uh, or you can say, "Oh, wait a minute, you know, I accidentally, you know, this guy is actually in the race." Then you can undo that DNS by 
basically doing another DNS and it'll undo it. Um, and so the nice thing with this feature is uh, it will, when you scan your DNS tags, it will tell you at the top of the screen, and it actually does this even without scanning, but it's a more accurate number if you scan your DNS tags. Uh, it will tell you, okay, you've got 274 participants. You've got one finisher. Let me go ahead and add some more here. Um, it's got one finisher, seven finishers now, and you've got 10 that are DNS. Therefore, the program's best guess is you've got 257 on the course. So um, this is another common question you get as a timer is, hey, how many is left on the course? Well, if you do your DNS scan, uh, then this can tell you. Um, and so that's uh, very helpful information. Again, everything you see on the screen here, I'm hoping if you're new to this system, you're like, dang, that's, yeah, you're right. That is a common question. Now I can answer that easily. Again, the reason I put this here is, is, uh, because I, this is what I deal with every weekend. So I, I basically I know what I need. I know, what, you know, um, probably what you're going to need. So, um, yeah, and my, the reason I say that is because, uh, there shouldn't be anything new. They're like, oh man, I can't believe this program doesn't have that. Uh, now, of course, if you, if you're using this for some, um, like one thing that's lacking right now is it doesn't do any kind of series-based scoring. Um, and so that's something that, you know, we'll probably be adding in the future, but um, there's just that. And I'm, it seems like maybe there's one other thing that's kind of a rare thing um, that the program doesn't do. But everything else for your typical races, this system can handle. You know, for example, the chip starts, uh, it can do that no problem. It can do remote read points on the course. It can do um, you know, all that stuff. So, all right. Okay, let me go through my list again. Um, uh, so we need to cover what you do whenever you're on the race uh, on race day. So typically, you will um, you know, set up your computer and uh, you will be entering people in. And so after you enter people in, you've got a new new list of people that are not. Yeah, you know, this is not in your other computers. So how do you update your other computers with all the people you put in on race day? Um, and so all you have to do is uh, the actual database file, this is the file that contains everything, this race timing.db, and you can determine where this file is placed. I place mine on my desktop just because it's easy to find. Um, and, but whenever I go time a race, I'll create a folder for that race and I'll put a copy of that database in there. That way I never have, you know, I never have to worry about losing those results. Um, but, um, so that was, yeah, so the, uh, I think, yeah, here's the triathlon of time. So I got all the photos and videos and, you know, results and everything in here. Um, so yeah, but anyways, um, so this database file contains everything. And so what happens is after I have finished doing my race day registration, there's two ways you can do it. You can manually copy the file over by simply, you know, you can right click and copy or, or plug and jump drive in and drag and drop it in there. But the safer way uh, is to use the copy this database feature. Now I try to put all kinds of tool tips in where like if you put your mouse over it tells you hey this is used to copy your database to a jump drive um, or you know from this pc to a memory stick so you click on that you plug it in jump drive if you haven't don't have it in there already you select that drive and hit ok uh, and i don't have a jump drive plugged in but let's just say this nexus that's my well let's just say this drive right here the c drive which of course is this computer you click ok and it copies a database out to it for you and that way you don't have to worry about overriding your database by accident, but, you know, copying the wrong way. Let's say you plug a jump drive in and, and drag from the jump drive to the desktop and overwrite your database uh, with an old one. Well, then guess what? You've lost all your race day entries and all your, you know, everything. Um, so that would be disastrous. So you make sure that you practice that before race day. Um, all right. So that's how you base. And once you copy that database to a jump drive, by the way, um, you can plug that jump drive into your other computer. And you will overwrite its database with the one on your jump drive because it's the newest one. And so you can do that one of two ways. You can simply drag and drop it onto the jump, you know, to the desktop or wherever you've got your file, and it'll ask you, "Are you sure you want to replace this file?" And you hit yes. Or you can go to Open Race, Race Day Actions, and Replace Database. And what you do is you click on Replace Database. You select your jump drive or actually the database file itself. So let's say that uh, this file is the one on your jump drive. You hit Open. It'll ask you. Um, are you sure you're going to replace it? Yes, and you're done. And when you do that, you'll see that now these computers are perfectly in sync. Both of them have the same number of people. Everything's ready to go. Um, now, there's another way to do this. You can also do that from the race day tools and replace this database. So, you know, from a memory stick to this PC. Um, and it works the same way. So, all right. So that's how you update your computers after race day registration is over. Uh, I wanted to cover that because I've had a few customers that tell me that they didn't know that that's how you did it. And so they were like exporting a file and trying to import it. 
um, on the other computer. And, you know, of course, that takes a long time. Um, I mean, when I say a long time, it takes, um, you know, a, a minute or two compared to what I just showed you should take just a couple seconds. Um, all right, so we've covered starting multiple races at different times. Um, uh, one thing I want to cover back on the clock screen is it's it's always a little surprising to me, but I totally understand why, that I have some people that, that, that don't know um, kind of how how this works here and when it comes to capturing times and putting bid members with them. So let's imagine that you're doing manual timing. Um, so the, 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 the original, the original design, the best design, I think, um, uh, cause the program can work in a few different ways. Uh, cause some people are used to like web score or race director, or so I don't know how run score, you know, some other programs work. I don't know really how to, uh, even web score and run score. I don't know how they work. I've never used them, but, um, uh, from it's my understanding that some programs are designed so that you type in a bib number and press enter. And you're supposed to try to do that right when the person finishes. For me, that sounds like it's a horrible way to do it because if you got five people coming at the same time, there's no way you can type fast enough to get all five within a fairly reasonable amount of time. Uh, and I'm just I'm just punching random numbers. And of course, if you're trying to hit dedicated numbers, it's even harder. Um, so the way this is designed is that I have uh, I'm always a one man show when I go time a race, and I want the software to be easy enough to where that's you know that's okay. Um, so usually what I do is I have the race director. I say, look, I, I need at least five volunteers. Really, I tell them five. I'm hoping to get two. Um, so uh, I say, look, I need at least five volunteers, and you know they're going to be working with me at the finish line. And those volunteers, they run my manual backup system. And what I, what I have them do is I want the jobs to be so simple that they're they're easy, um, and that anybody can do it. And so one person's job is every time someone finishes, all they do is hit the space bar. That's their only job. So here, and what I tell them is, if you've got five coming real fast, don't try to go as fast as you can because you'll miscount. What I tell them is do five de dedicated presses. One, two, three, four, five. So even though that was five dedicated presses, you'll see that it's within about a second. Um, so it's still fairly accurate. Um, what's more important on the manual timing system is not the accuracy of the times. You, you care more about the number of times you capture. And the reason why is because as you start to fill in bib numbers, let me see what numbers we have here. Let's just start at 260. So as you start to fill in bib numbers, it'll go down the list here. Um, filling them in an order. And so um, now the program is designed. Some people say, well, I don't want it. I, um, I don't want it like that to where it fills them in in order. Maybe I want it to where as I type a number in, it always creates a new time. So I can still hit the space bar. But if I type in a number, it puts a new time in with the with that number. So let's say 250, 251 and so on. Um, so you can you can check this box here. And if you do that, then it will uh, work like like if you're already used to a different program working that way and this, you want this program to work that same way, you just check that box. Um, but the, in my opinion, the best design is to simply hit the space bar and then have someone at the end of the shoot with the bib number capture sheet, which I'll show you real quick here. Oops, let me do that and refresh. And when it prints, it actually looks like this. And so I have someone at the end of the shoot writing numbers down in order. Uh, and they've got this notes field here if they wanted to, you know, randomly write a time down. That way it's kind of time stamped of when, when things are at. Or they can make a note like, oops, I wrote these backwards or whatever. Um, so I have one volunteer capturing times and one volunteer writing numbers at the end of the shoot. And if my chip timing computer were to completely fail, then I can go, I can resort to this where I'm simply typing numbers in order and it fills out the results this way. So this is my, you know, fail safe backup. Um, now it's extremely rare that you should have to use it, but you know, as a hired professional, it would be irresponsible not to have at least one backup system in place. Um, and so, um, I will say there's one other thing you can do here. So let's say that I don't have this checked and I'm timing the race. So I'm going to hit the space bar and I'm capturing times. And let's say that every now and then I do want to put a, a, a number and timestamp in, but I don't want to have to, you know, cause in the sunlight, it's hard to find your mouse. And so there's actually shortcuts where you can press the caps lock key and it'll trigger that. Um, but let's say you don't want to turn that on really. You just want every now and then to, to put a time in. Uh, you can do a shift enter. So if I type in a number, let's say 253 and do shift enter, it will force a time with a bib number. So that's kind of one of those things where if, if, if you wanted to, every now and then you can put kind of little, little benchmarks along the way so that as you start to type in numbers later, um, you'll know if, you, if you're off. Uh, looks like I got some gaps in my numbers here, 198, 199, 200. Um, so you will know if you get down to here, 
as you're filling numbers out, if this is not 273, that tells you you've got a gap somewhere. And, uh, you know, then you got to figure it out. And so let's say you find, oh, well, actually there was a finisher at 10 seconds. Well, then simply hit the space bar, adjust that to, you know, 10 seconds. Um, and let's just say that was 251. And now you've got that gap. And hopefully now your numbers match up and 253 is right there where it should be. Another option, by the way, is let's say you find, oh, man, you know, I've got all my numbers filled out. But starting at this point, everything's off by one. Well, then you can do shift numbers down from here. And so to shift all the bid numbers down, um, I mean, the thing is there's there's all kinds of ways to manipulate the data in here. Uh, everything I've ever needed to do or ever thought it might need to do, it, it should be in here. Um, so anyways, so that's some quick tips on how to, how to actually time. And the reason I wanted to cover this because I heard some people that would actually capture the time. And then for every one, they come in here and double click 255, double click. 257. And so they were double clicking each one instead of simply uh, you know, typing in the numbers order. Like that. All right. Now you could have someone, by the way, sitting next to the person capturing times and trying to put numbers in, in real time. Uh, and I should have covered this earlier. In the very beginning, um, the first two years, I would say, of timing, I would uh, be doing the chip timing and I would have the volunteers where they were trying to keep these bib numbers and times. Uh, as close to real time as possible. And the reason why I stopped doing that is because, well, number one, the chip timing system hardly ever, I and mean, there's ever, never an issue. And if there is an issue, let's say someone runs by and they're not, not picked up, well, I simply put them in. You know, and that way my chip timing system is still my main system. I'm not going to, you know, you know, give up on the whole thing simply because a couple people I got to, you know, alter or whatever. And so what I found, though, is the volunteers, if they're trying to, you know, they've never seen this system. This is, the, you just train them that day usually. And so, if you have someone capturing times and you've got someone else uh, typing in numbers, they will mistakenly transpose a number. Let's say they've been to type in 281, they type in 218. Well, what happens is they start freaking out because they think they've destroyed the whole race. And so they become a distraction to me when really the chip timing system is working flawless and I don't really need the results anyways. Now, if I need them, usually I need just a part of it. Like, hey, what was that last time or whatever? So what I found is easiest and makes it stress-free for everybody is I, I have one person, their only job is capturing times and nothing else. And then I have somebody else writing numbers down. And again, that's my backup system. Now I usually have a camera uh, in place and all that stuff too. But um, So that's the reason why I set my system up the way um, that way. So, All right, let's see what else is in the list here. Um, capturing times and bib numbers. We've covered swapping bib numbers. Uh, programming tags. So before you get hired to time a race, in fact, you can even program all your tags before you have a single race uh, in your system. Um, the tag simply returns a bib number. Now, other systems work different, but the way I wanted it to work is um, whenever I program a tag, I can put a tag there, and I could say, well, I want this tag to be, let's say, um, let me find, let's just say I want this tag to be bib number 800. Then you simply type in 800, press enter key, and there, there it goes. Uh, I can also say um, I want this tag to be race specific, but I would I would say never use this feature unless you absolutely know what you're doing. Um, because the reason why, let's say you've got a 5K and a 10K, well, if someone swaps races, then you can't simply swap their race in the software. You have to give them a new bib because their bib is tied to their 5K or 10K. Um, and so this feature is really only useful whenever you're timing a race where you've got, let's say, a 5K and a 3K on an indoor track. And the athletes and, and those races are going to be wearing bib numbers 1 through 12 or 1 through 15. You know, the same bib numbers across multiple races. Well, in that case, you don't want the people warming up for the 5K to be picked up during the 3K. Because if, it, you know, if bib number 1 comes around, the software won't know which race they belong to. And it assumes that's the, the, the bib number 1 for this race. And so if you make a tag race specific, the software will know to ignore any races, any tags not in that race. Um, another situation where that might come in handy is if you're in a position where maybe you're timing a kid's cross-country race and the finish line is uh, right there next to the starting line and you know you know that the kids are going to be lining up and you know tags are going to get picked up. Um, now, by the way, if the tags are not the same as the ones in the race you're currently timing, it's perfectly fine if those tags show up as unassigned. Let me show you what that looks like. Um, so if I pull up this race and I've got some tags over here that are not in this race, then you'll see they come up in red. Now, it looks like one of those tags is in this race, but the uh, the other tags are not. <coughs> Any tag that shows up in red is not included in the results anyway. So uh, don't let that bother you if you see some red times there. They're just ignored. 
If it did bother you, you can highlight all of them and just do delete. Um, but again, it doesn't hurt anything for those to be there. All right. Um, back to programming tags real quick. Uh, you can program your tags pretty quickly if you do the auto increment. Um, so let's say I've got um, this tag right here, and uh, I simply type in the number I want, and when it finishes programming, it will, oh, I didn't do the auto increment. So let's say I go to number two. When it finishes programming, it auto increments to the next one. So that way I can grab another tag, hit the enter key, 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 and so on. And so you can kind of go through your tags quickly that way. And if you're doing two tags per person, you can say, well, after the second right, then increment. So there's all kinds of options in here. All right. Um, so we covered programming tags. All right, so the reader setup. So let's go over that. This will be quick. The software will automatically add any USB readers you have. Uh, and it also does the same thing with cameras, by the way. Sometimes people ask me, how does the camera work? Basically, you just hook up your camera and it works. I mean, there's no configuration at all. I recommend Canon cameras. They, uh, the T3, T3i, or XSI, they seem to be the most, um, uh, the best value, and that's what I use, and they, they just work. Uh, well, often you can find those online for like $250, uh, and they just they work great. Um, but as for the readers themselves, the USB readers you'll see here are added, added automatically. Uh, the 4-port or 2-port or 8-port readers, you have to add those in, and I recommend that you uh, simply type in just the host name. Um, the, the software, if you typed in IP address, let's say 192, I don't know, just make up one here. Uh, this is not even a real IP, but um, so if you type one in, the software will try the IP address first, and if that fails, it will then try the host name, and if that fails, then it will try the default IP, unless, unless it has already tried the default IP of 169.254.1.1. .1. So the software will actually try up to three different methods to try to connect. And so it's very reliable because even if you type in the wrong IP, typically it'll connect by host name. But the reason why I recommend putting just the host name, now if you're a network professional, by the way, and you know how to do static IPs and make sure everything's always going to connect, hey, go for it. Uh, in fact, that's what Motorola recommends, but they assume that if you're setting up a reader, you are a network, you know, networking professional. Um, but for, for your average person, and I'm, I'm included in this because I don't do networking stuff. Um, the, the host name is a sticker on the side of the reader. If it's if it's the black reader, the, the FX 9500. If it's the white reader, the 7400 or the 7500, the Motorola, um, then it's a, a sticker on the top of the reader. Now, sometimes if you buy an eBay, uh, a B eBay reader or whatever, they don't have the stickers on them. You can read here how to find the host name. It's, it's basically the model number, which is either FX 7500, FX 9500, or 7400. Um, and then the last six characters of the MAC address. And so, again, you can read this and find out more about that. Motorola, or actually Zebra, Zebra bought out Motorola's RFID division a few years ago, or a couple years ago. Um, yeah, that is the recommended reader to use. The FX9500 is seems to be the undisputed king. I mean, I've had um, lots of people come from, you know, Alien or uh, Pinge readers, and it's the Motorola just stands out. It's just amazing. Uh, and again, you can hook up to eight antennas to it. It's a rugged class reader, so it's designed to be used on, like, forklifts and rough environments. It's just awesome. Um, very powerful reader. But the software does allow you to use Alien or Pinge or Think Magic or Thinkify readers. Um, and so... Um, the I've got mine disabled because you know for the purpose of the demo I don't want it to try to wait for it to try to connect to those readers. Um, and, and another reason why I don't recommend putting an IP address is if it fails, you know it's going to take five to ten seconds before the the software gives up trying to connect by IP before it connects by hostname. And so if you find that when you connect to your reader it's taking like five to ten seconds or more to finally so connected, that tells me that it's really struggling. Maybe the hostname's wrong, maybe the IP is wrong, um, and so that's something to look at. And, and by the way, the software can add, you can add as many readers. Um, the software can accept data from as many readers at the same time as you want. You simply, for example, if you've got two or three readers, you're going to hook up to your laptop, just buy a router, hook your readers up to your laptop, or sorry, to the router, hook the router up to the laptop, and boom, you're ready to go. Or I guess if, you're wireless, if your router is wireless, you can even have a wireless connection to your readers. I wouldn't recommend that because, I mean, you know, with something as important as race timing, uh, you don't want some kind of weird variable to cause some tags not to come across or something. But um, but anyways, that's uh, an option. So uh, that's reader setup, uh, camera setup. I just mentioned that um, as you connect your camera, it just uh, the very first time you connect your camera, it'll uh, download the drivers itself. 
And then from that point forward, the program simply, when you pull up the clock screen, it'll automatically detect it um, and add it, uh, or not even add it, sorry, it will enable the camera. So in the, at that point forward, anytime you capture time, whether it be hitting a space bar or uh, you know tag read, it automatically triggers the camera. So it works, works great. Now, sometimes I get questions about what the camera settings should be. You know, there's a little wheel on the top you can spin around. I've always done either full automatic or actually the, the P, which is right next to the full auto. Uh, and I, I make sure your zoom is on automatic. And because that seems to, I mean, it, it triggers quick. It does a great job. I never have to worry about the quality of the pictures. Um, so that's that's what I use there. You know, if you're a, a camera photography expert, you may be able to find a better setting. Um, th- those cameras have actually a little running symbol on them, like a sports mode. But for some reason, it always takes the worst pictures in sports mode. Um, so I always use the uh, the portrait mode. All right, so we talked about stopping the clock, I believe. Uh, like I said, that's kind of like the light in your refrigerator. When you're done timing the race, just simply close it. Do not press F2 if you have results you want to keep. Pressing F2 is the assumption, hey, I've done some testing, and I want to clear out the you know results and, and set the race back to zero. Um, so keep that in mind. All right, so the next thing we're going to cover is division setup. So before race day, you want to make sure that you know how the awards are going to be broken out or what the divisions are. So in this race, for example, the race director says, hey, I'm going to give away just one overall male award and one overall female award, and I'm going to do one Walker award. Um, now, I, I did this. I didn't have to, but I said, well, if, um, um, if there are the overall male runner or Walker, or sorry, overall female or overall male, um, exclude them. Um, but anyways, yeah, these divisions looks like they're open. So I guess if someone walked fast enough to be the overall winner, then they would be the overall male. And that's the reason why I did that. The overall walker would then exclude the overall male. Uh, or if it was a female that won overall, uh, simply by walking, then she would be excluded because I've got this exclusion here. Um, the way this is designed to work is, uh, and it would maybe make more sense if I create a new race. Uh, let's do... I'm at touchpad's not working. So new race, and if I go to divisions, uh, by default I throw in divisions that you know a lot of running races need. You can get rid of these if you want. Uh, so let's say I get rid of all of them. Um, you know, or of course you can use them. So let's say that we're going to do zero to I don't know ninety nine, and I'm going to also create a female division. And again, this is the same way as timing a race, where if you if you don't check anything off, the assumption is it's open to everybody. So checking them both off or leaving both unchecked is the same thing. Um, so I'm going to say overall male. Now, as you put in a date range, it kind of fills in this description. So if you're doing the overall divisions, then you have to change that. So you see how it does female overall. Or so female is even 99. I'm going to say overall female. And then um, I'm going to save that. And so now I'm going to do my age divisions. So I'm going to say, well, this race is going to have a five-year gap. And it's going to be starting off zero to nine. And I want to also create the female division of it. And I want to exclude the... the um, uh, actually, let's create the male first, and we don't. It doesn't matter which one, but I'm going to create the male first, and I'm going to say exclude the overall males. And you'll see here when I hit save, it automatically jumps the age up, and automatically created the female division, and it automatically did the exclusions. So all I have to do is hit save, 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 and then there's all my divisions until you know a certain point. And let's say it's going to be uh, I don't know 70 plus. Uh, then I may say 70 plus. And, of course, I wanted to exclude overalls, and there we go. Uh, now, of course, again, it does it by the age range here. So for females, i got to adjust that. And so now let's just say this race is also going to give away Masters Awards. So let's go ahead and create a 42.99. And uh, I'm going to create the males first, and I'm going to exclude the overall winners. And we're going to call this uh, Male Masters. And there's going to be three runners. I can, of course, change that number uh, for any of the other divisions. I'm going to save that. And so now I should have at the bottom male masters. I should have had it. No, oh, okay, I did actually have it create female masters. Let's go ahead and say female masters. Now, the idea here is that uh, you enter your divisions in the order of priority. So your, your, your highest divisions or the overall winners are at the top. And so the way this works is we're going to move the masters to where it's under the overalls, because that's a pretty important category. So let's move it here. And then let's move the female masters. Now, of course, what, what I'm doing here, you can do the exact same thing for the grandmasters or senior grandmasters. Um, you know, different states, you know, they, they seem to 
Um, I think in uh, Mississippi, they, they almost always had the three categories. You know, you got overall male masters, grandmasters, senior grandmasters, and you got your age division. And so when the software looks at each division, it says, hey, is there anything above me that should be where those winners should be excluded? Well, we've got male masters and female masters. Most races want to spread the wealth, which means, you know, you want as many people as possible to walk away with an award. So if someone wins overall and they are 41 years old, then they usually don't win the male masters too. Now you can have it to where that's not an exclusion and they are included in both. But in most cases, you want as many people as possible to win an award. For example, if I'm the overall winner, I'm not going to go home and show my wife and kids, hey, look at my male 30 to 35 year old first place trophy. No, I'm going to show them, hey, look, I won the race. I'm overall male. Um, and so the idea here is that you can come in here now that I've, now that I've created those uh, master's divisions, I can say, hey, um, if they win the race or if they're in the male masters, the top three, exclude them from this division. And so that'll basically bump everyone up. Um, so now I'm going to add my exclusions in. I really should have created the master's divisions first. That way I could have uh, done this a lot faster. But I just want to get you know, show you this so you get the idea. All right, so you go through here and then do that exclusion. Again, if I would have done the, the master's divisions first, then I could have had the software automatically do the exclusions as you saw before. But anyways, that's how you set up divisions. So make sure that your divisions match what the race director is going to give out. Uh, another quick thing with the software is if you have the race director's name and email, let me just put my name in here. Um, Um, you can click on this button here, uh, actually this one here, and then email them how, everything you have set up about the race. You know, the race date, distance, all the divisions. So this little thing right here, this magnifying glass, will give you a preview of what, what, what the email would say. So, you know, thank you for giving us the opportunity to time your race. Uh, to ensure accurate results, please review everything below, basically. Um, and so here you can come in here and she'll see the award breakdown. And if this doesn't match the awards that she bought, she can tell you, hey, wait, you've got something wrong set up here. Um, so again, I, I did that because I want my timing crews to, to know, I don't want there to be any surprise on race day. Now, if there is a surprise, let's say that she opens up her box of trophies on race morning and finds that, y'all, yeah, oh man, instead of doing five year gaps, I did 10. You can easily, even after the race, uh, change these divisions and reprint the results. No big deal. Um, but you don't want to have to deal with it on a race day cause you got enough to deal with. So you want to make sure this is set up right before race day. So, um, all right. So that's another quick tip for uh, new timers or new users of the system. All right, importing athletes. So if you are uh, timing a race, you're going to get a, a file if you, unless you have um, – um, now, if, if the race is on run sign up or race roster uh, or if it's a cross-country race and the, uh, the event is on TFERS, then which is track and field reporting something, um, then you can simply um, – ask that they give you access to the race. You, they can list you as a race director, I think, or a race timer. Uh, and there's different, you know, the different websites work different. They can give you access to where you can simply pull that in, uh, the race in and all the participants in. Or let's say this race right here, I can say, hey, I want to link this event to an event on run sign up or an event on race roster. And you can put in your credentials or the race director's credentials if she want to, uh, he or she wants to share it with you and then simply link it. And then when you do that, it'll automatically pull the athletes in and, you can simply hit the sync button. For example, this race uh, is on run sign up. So all I got to do is hit sync and it pulls in the athletes anytime I want. Um, so really nice how that works. Now, if you have a file, an Excel file, then let's say that we create a race. Uh, we're going to call it the um, mito what? Because it's uh, a race for mitochondria research or mitochondrial disease of some kind. Um, and so you can put in the information and hit save. And so here, if you get a file, and if it's a delimited file, like a CSV file or anything else, you can pull that in. Uh, so let's do a delimited file, and I'm going to pick, um, I think I've got, yeah, this model, what participants here. And if it's a pop delimited or comma or semicolon, it doesn't matter. You uh, you figure out what it is. And if it's comma, which is you know, the vast majority of the cases, you click OK, and it'll ask you as a first row or column header. You hit Yes. And basically here, now this file is actually already formatted to be in the right spot. But the idea is you can, uh, let's say the bib number is over here. We simply drag the bib number and drop it into the bib number spot. So your idea is to get the bib number and all the other fields to line up with what you have. Now, you may not have some of these fields. Like, what if your file doesn't have an athlete type? Well, you can add a blank column. Uh, let's do add column. Uh, and you'll see that as I maneuver stuff, 
it will automatically resize the column so that it's easier to eyeball that things are in the right spot. Um, so you can add columns, you can remove columns, you can split columns, you can merge columns. Uh, so let's say that the first and last name is in this one column right here. Well, you can say, I want to split this column based on a space or based on, let's say it's last name, comma, first name. I want to split it based on the comma. And whenever you split it, of course, it puts it in separate fields and you can drag it to the right spot. Um, let's say that this file contained like five blank rows. And really, blank rows are ignored anyway, so you can just leave them there. But if it, if it bothered you, then you can say, well, I'm going to get rid of those rows. Uh, actually, sorry, you, you don't right click. You, uh, you simply hit this red minus button and it'll get rid of them. Um, you can also say, well, you know, for some reason, let's say this file contains four different races. Um, then you can say, well, you, know, you, can, you can sort any of these by clicking on them. So I'm going to sort it by race. And I'm going to say, well, I'm going to import only these selected records. So let's say just these. And when you hit import, it just pulls those in. Um, so let me give you a quick preview of how this works. I'm going to uh, drag things around. Let's say last name, first name, gender. Another thing, by the way, is let's say that the file uh, has data that doesn't match what the program expects. Now, I've tried to make every column to where it figures out the data. Um, so, for example, for gender, yeah, if you if it's got boy, girl, woman, uh, man, uh, female, girls, women's, or whatever, it, it it knows. Okay, we'll map that to female. And so, but if you wanted to double check that things are valid, you can do change column data, and you say, hey, everywhere it says, uh, um, so the expected value is M or F or male or female. So you can say, well, everywhere it says female, make it say F. Or everywhere it's got a misspelling, make it say that. So I mean, there's different things you can do to mani manipulate that in here. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and do this import. Um, it will automatically add teams and do all kinds of stuff. You simply just import it, basically. So I'm going to hit import. And, oh, I did select a records. That's why. Let me do all records. Uh, I actually have to do that again. Because once you do the import, it, it assumes you're done. So we'll just do this quick. Uh, delimited file. No matter what participants. Now, by the way, I'm glad we're doing this again because let's say that uh, something happens and you realize, because this actually happened a few years ago with another customer, that they uh, they imported data and somehow, so I don't know, I can't remember exactly what it was, but somehow all the bib numbers and names are wrong. The, the bib numbers they used were the right bib numbers in the race, but did not match the bib numbers in the file, the actual real file they should have pulled from. And so what's nice is, uh, and this was after the race was done and, and they've timed it. So what's nice is he, um, pulled in the correct file with the bib numbers and put in, you know, again, the right bib number, right name. And then when he hit import, the software knows that the bib number is basically treated as a primary identifier. And all it did was simply update all the all the, all the other information uh, based on that bib number. So let's say that bib number 13, when he showed up to time the race, belonged to John Doe, who's a male. Well, if he re-imported this file and it's got the same bib numbers, well, then the software will treat that as an updated file that it, that it should use, and it uses the bid number as a key. So when he re-imported the file, he didn't lose any times. Uh, and when he imported it now, that bid member 13, who was John Doe, is Catherine Arnold, which is the correct one. And so then he was able to print results. Um, so, I mean, this is a cool thing. I try to put all kinds of stuff in, like I said. Um, and, and by the way, if Catherine, let's say that there is no bib numbers in this file, uh, you can drag a blank column in the software will ask you which bib number you use or start with in the auto increments. But let's say that there is no bib numbers. Well, if it sees that Catherine Arnold is already in the race, it won't import them again. So you can import the same file multiple times without having a bunch of duplicates. Um, so anyways, let's go ahead and import this file. And you see it working down here at the bottom. And now there's 430 participants in this race. And you'll see that that one I pulled in before is not duplicated in here. Um, so, all right, so that is importing data. You want to make sure, of course, the, one of the important questions you want to ask before a race day is, uh, you know, what time, when does online registration close? Because I've seen some races that keep it closed until the morning of the race, which, of course, wears you out. Because at midnight, what if a bunch of people register, you know, at midnight after you've gone to bed and, then you have to worry about getting those in. So, yeah, I always tell the race director, for me personally, I say, hey, you know, would you mind please closing the registration no later than noon the day before the race? And that way, you know, after noon, you know it's safe to pull the data, and all you have to worry about then is the race day entries. All right, so uh, there's we're getting close to the end of my list here. There's two things that I'd recommend that you do before every race, and you want to, and I, I put a little asterisk here to say typically use for every race. 
So one thing you want to do is print off a bib number capture sheet. So if the race is expecting um, 100 people, then I might print off a sheet that's got 198 slots. You may say, well, why not 198? Well, because one page holds 99, and I want to have a, a full page of numbers. But I don't want to have I don't want to have a one page with one number, right? So yeah, you know, I try to find that balance where um, it's you know fills out the complete page. So you print the bib number capture sheet, and the day before the race or you know after registration closes, you want to print off a race roster, and this simply lists all numbers uh, with the names, and that way when uh, Kurt Armstrong shows up, you know which bib number to hand him. Now there's little check boxes beside each number. Um, I like to use that. Um, as a way to know who picked up their bib or not. And of course, there is that scan DNS feature, but I like to have the participant or the volunteer check their name off that they pick their stuff up. And I also like to have the participant to review their information because if the information on this report is right, the results will be right. But what you'll find is that um, there's a lot of online registration companies that default the gender to like female or male, and the person didn't see it and they didn't change it, and so now they're the wrong gender. And what that, of course, can do is when you're giving out awards, that can totally screw up, um, you know, the division they should have been in plus the division they actually are in mistakenly. So if a male shows up as the female 30 to 35 winner, well, then, of course, it bumps all the females down, which means they got the wrong award. And let's say he would have won his division, too. Well, that means, you know, if they've already given out those awards and those people probably have already left, it just causes a big headache. And so you want to make sure that the information is right Um and I do that by having the participant verify the, this information on the uh, on the report. Um, I want to go ahead and talk about one other thing that's, uh, in my mind, a, a critical thing, a, an important thing you want to do for every race, which is the tag check feature. Now, let me actually use that for this other race where I've got these tags that match. And so I'm going to go to Race Day Tools. And uh, I use a little USB reader, but you can really use any reader. I like the USB reader because it doesn't read every tag in the room. But even with it, I point the antenna straight up. That way, you know, the tags that pass over the antenna are the only ones that are red. Um, and it also acts kind of like a little table. Uh, so if the race is giving away race packets, then I will simply say, hey, you know, put your packet on top of the table. They don't have to take the tag out of the bib out. Um, and so the way this works is, let me get this tag away from here. Um, so the way this works is the participant will simply scan their tag. And if everything on the screen is right, that means that your results are going to be right for that person. And so uh, you know, let's say another person walks up and scans their tag, and then there you go. So I simply use the tag check feature before race day. Uh, you know, one antenna with a USB reader connected to my registration computer, and this is usually uh, docked onto a large screen TV that they're looking at. You simply drag it any more than 50% and double click, and it docks it full screen. Um, so I have this on one computer, and then I'm over here registering on another. And that way, if someone walks up and says, whoa, wait a minute, my information is not right, well, then you find them in the list. And you simply change your information. You know, okay, well, that's a that's a mail or whatever. Um, and then then they can rescan their tag, and uh, everything's ready to go. So, all right. So that is the tag check feature. I highly recommend that you use that. Um, I think the rest of this hopefully is pretty quick. Uh, just in the race clock. Okay, one at a time. We've covered that. Uh, we've covered the read rates about the importance of angle and do not, uh, do not put the oh, – one thing I didn't say is never – I've had a couple customers, they had to – we learned early on, do not put like a paper label on top of the tag if, if you use our laminated all-weather tags, you know, the reusable ones. Um, and the reason why is because some people understand why they wanted to put like a, a little paper label on the tag as like advertising for the company. The problem is if you have a race where it runs through dew or if it, if it rains that race um, – then that tag has even that paper label is enough water to, to completely decrease or eliminate the tag from being able to be picked up. And so that's how little water it takes. Now, by the way, water beaded up is not a big deal. But if you have a layer of water covering the tag, that's a big deal. So don't put paper labels on your tags. You want to make sure before race day that your printer is set up. Now, the, the software will use whatever is set up as your default printer. Um, but, uh, you know, you want to go ahead and make sure that the, the printer you're going to use on race day is selected here. That way, when you use the quick, the quick print functions, um, so if I'm timing a race, I can easily, let me pull up the clock screen here. I can easily press uh, like shift O and the overall results come out where I can, where I can click, on the link, click on the link right here. Um, and so you want to make sure your printer is set up. That way, all you got to do is hit a, you know, a key combination, shift O or shift D for division results, or click on the link and boom, it spits, spits them right out to the printer real quick. Um, 
So let's see what else we've got. Uh, one thing I'll say is, and this is something I'll, I'll, I highly stress again, especially for your first few races, is show up ridiculously early to your race. What I mean by that is, if you're new to timing, you may not be aware of how long it takes to set stuff up, and it is a huge headache if you're scrambling the whole time. Um, and so don't think you're going to show up an hour before race day and have plenty of time to set up a whole finish line. What you want to do is, let's say the race starts at 8 o'clock, and let's say that registration starts at 6.45 or 7, then you probably want to be at the race at like 4.30 in the morning. Um, and that way you've got you know uh, basically two hours to set up. And let's say that you don't get everything set up because let, maybe you get there and then you find out, oh man, the, the gate to the, the finish line is locked and I can't even walk there. Um, if you get behind for some reason, then train a volunteer on how to do the race day registration. And what I tell them is simply, Everything in the gray box at the top has to be right. Don't focus on anything else. Don't try to put address in, which I never do anyway. Uh, I say if there's no line, go ahead and get email address because the software will email them the results afterwards. But uh, everything in the gray box, I say, has to be right. Um, and so train a volunteer on how to put people in. That way you can focus on the finish line. Never put yourself in a position where you think that you can finish doing your setup from the time the race starts until the first finisher comes in, because you'll always get distracted. You got to train the volunteers on what to do. Uh, you know, stuff always comes up. So make sure your finish line, what you want to do is you want to be in a position where your finish line is completely set up and no one has showed up at the race yet, or at least, you know, you've got enough downtime before registration starts to be, sit and breathe for a second and relax and think about, okay, do I have everything ready? Is, you know, am I ready to go? Um, is there anything else I should do? Um, so make sure that you show up ridiculously early. I, I try to shoot for like two and a half, three hours um, before race day. But again, I'm, I'm by myself most times, so you may not need that much, but uh, don't don't try to cut it short. I'll, I would also say set at least two alarms as a timer. It would be, there's no excuse for oversleeping and then, you know, you got hundreds of people there waiting on you and the race director is freaking out. I, I, um, I equate a race director as a bride on her wedding day. You know, this is their big day. They've worked months for it. And, you know, you as a timer, you need to come through as the hero, not as, you know, the scapegoat. You, you don't you don't want them to be able to have anything they can throw on you. Uh, you want to be able to, you know, when this race is over, for them to say, man, I couldn't do this without you. you guys are amazing. Um, all right. So uh, the last thing is questions to ask before race day to ensure everything goes smooth. Um, so one thing that I recommend, I, I showed you in the user's forum, uh, my quick tips on uh, you know computer setup and different stuff. One thing I do before every race, no matter how much I have time, is I go to the timer's notes. Now, this is where I type in, because you know, we time uh, hundreds of races a year, uh, or at least I think about 100 if you look at all the different events and everything. Um, I've got an old database here. Let's go to downloads. So I think this is one of our databases. Um, you know, it's It's full of races. And the software, by the way, automatically groups races by year. And so if I want to view last year's races, there they are. Um, but, you know, we time so many races that I can't keep it straight. When I get an email from a race director about, oh, you know, here's something important, I simply open up that race and I copy what she's, you know, sent me. Maybe maybe she tells me what time registration closes or race day registration starts or where the power supply is at or whatever. I type that note in here. That way I can always have that. Uh, so, you know, the week before the race, I can pull up my notes and get kind of a refresher. And then um, what I do a day or two before the race is I review this tips area. Once I've reviewed this, if I've satisfied everything in here, that tells me, hey, I'm, I'm probably ready for the race. So this is something you want to check out. That's under when you edit the race. It's under timers, notes, and tips. Um, so a couple things you want to ask, before, and this is the last thing I think I'll show. Um, the couple things you want to ask before race day is, for example, um, what it, are they going to have mailing registration forms? Because what you don't want to do is show up at a race and the race director on race morning hands you a stack of 70 people you got to type in on race day. What, what you want to do is uh, either email them an Excel file or you know, I use a Google Sheet, a Google, um, uh, basically Google Excel. It's, it's, uh, I think it's called Google Sheets. And it's a shared Excel document, basically. And I can actually watch as they're putting stuff in. But what's nice is you know, I create it with my account and I share that link with them. And then at any time I can log in and see if they're putting stuff in. And I can download it anytime I want to. But the thing is, you want them to, to do the job or even ha you know, have them uh, assign that job to one of their race volunteers um, to put the data, you know, those race entries into the system. That way you can easily import them. And so 
that's one question you want to ask before race day. Um, let's see. I think, I mean, I think we've covered, I'm looking through my list of questions here. I've, I've covered it and then any, any others are in here. Of course, you want to know how, how far away is the nearest power supply. You want to know, uh, for example, if they're having a fun run, um, you know, what time does it start? Because you don't want people from two different races uh, crossing at the same time. In fact, if a race says, well, I'm having a fun run, but I don't want it timed. Uh, and they will start and finish at the same time as other races I'm timing. Well, for me, I say, well, let me go ahead and time it because it's easier on me. I don't have to worry about who's in the race or not. Let's just let me pick everyone up. And they they usually appreciate that because they feel like, oh, you're doing something, you know, I'm getting a better value because you're doing something for free out of me. Well, it's it's free for you and it's easy on me. So let me just go ahead and time it. Um, so anyways, that's uh, another quick tip there. Um, so that's, that's all my notes. Let me take one last look at this software and see if there's anything that stands out that we need to cover. I'm not going to go over cross country, you know, some of the advanced stuff. I know this is a long video, but the design is uh, if you were to come uh, and sit with me for a day and you're a new user, this is all the stuff I try to cover with you. Um, all right. So uh, one thing I'll say is let's say that you've got um, a race that you need to duplicate. I mean, there are situations where you may need to do that. You, you can easily copy it and it'll even pull over all the same athletes and everything if you wanted to. Um, divisions, teams. Split descriptions. Okay, so this is a common question. What if you're timing a race that has, uh, um, let's say it's a, um ultra marathon and they are going to do three laps or something. And so let's say that on each lap, you know that people are going to probably take a drink of water and rest and, you know, and they may rest for five minutes and then finally get back on the course. And so you can actually set the gap time. The gap time represents how long a tag is ignored before another read of the tag is determined to be another lap. So if I set it, for example, to 600 seconds, um, uh, that it tells me that that's a uh, you know ten minute gap time. So if a tag is read, ignore it for ten minutes before you know you consider another read a, um, uh, you know another lap. Uh, anywhere that you see a question mark button, this software will give you tips on exactly what this is for and how to use it. So keep that in mind too. Um, so I can actually set this to six hundred seconds and say apply that to all of them. Um, so anyways, that's what how that works. Uh, giveaway items that's like t-shirts or hats or whatever the you know t-shirts is common so i put this link in here where you can actually easily add standard t-shirt sizes uh course mapping you can map your courses if you're sitting down the race you're trying to figure out you know maybe in the early stages of race uh you know i try to put all kinds of tools in here to be able to help anything they need um all right so nothing in there uh edit erase program tags um No, nothing else when you cover in there for for beginners. Um, this is kind of some of the advanced stuff that you may need. Um, let's say that you time a race and the race has to have a specific um, uh, that you know, like like a, I think ultramarathon.com, whatever, uh, or Boston. Let's say you time a race that's a Boston qualifier. And you need, you need the results in a specific format. The uh, the software can. Um, allow you to export the data in any format you need. So let's say I create a new format. And I'm going to call it, you know, Boston. Um, and then I'm going to say, I don't know what the file name would be. Maybe they don't care. I'm going to say, I'm just going to call it Boston 2. Um, and so it's going to create a Boston.csv file. And let's say that they tell you, well, the first thing I want to have is uh, time. So I'm going to go down here to the finishing time and I'm going to move that to the top. And really, you don't have to move it to the top if it's the only one selected because it, you know, it only prints what you have selected here. So let's say I want finishing time, and then I want uh, I'm going to do name, so I'm going to move the time up to the top. So say I want finishing time, then I want bid member, and I want uh, first name and then last name. So let me check those off. And then let's say they want gender. Let's say they want uh, age instead of date of birth. You can do one or the other, or or either both. Um, so basically, you pick all the fields you want. Let's say chip time. And then you can save that to say, okay, well, here's my Boston file. And so you should be able to manipulate the data and, and do anything you want. One thing I didn't cover is you can also say, well, instead of calling a bib number, they they have to have the column called uh, simply bib or bib no or whatever. Um, so you can rename the column to do anything you want, and then it creates that file for you exactly like the format that needs. So, um, all right, what else is in here? Um, I see that's the same thing as going to file and replace. I'm oh, sorry, not replace. So if you right click and do export to CSV, it's the exact same thing you get if you go to file export and the CSV here. Um, let's see, that covers just about everything, I think. 
Um, I will say, okay, one, one other thing is if I pull in multiple races, let's say I go time race and I pick all these races, these quick print functions operate based on whatever race you, you have selected here. So if I, let's say I'm timing the 5K, and let's just say that that 5K is now done. The last person just crossed. I can select the 5K and click on division results or overall results, and it will print that race. And I can, if I want to, I can remove that race from the list. From you know, But let's say I'll leave it for now. Uh, because if I remove it and then someone in the 5K comes up later, hey, how'd I do? Then you, know, you, won't, you wouldn't be able to use a quick function, a quick results because it's not in the clock screen anymore. So let's say I leave it. Um, and then let's say the 10K is done. Well, when I'm ready to print the 10K results, let's say is this one, then you simply click on it and the quick print functions will print just that race you have selected. So keep in mind that the quick print operates based on the race selected. All right, um, let's see what else is in here. Uh, I think that's going to cover it for now. I mean, there's all kinds of, you know, the um, show public display. I mean, it's it's there's lots of cool things in here I can dig uh, along time into all of the luxury features of results kiosk and the photo booth and all kinds of cool things they can do. But uh, my goal is I wanted this, even though it's long, to be something to where, okay, I have a good idea now on the basics and how things are set up and how they work and how they flow. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. Um, you know, I've got more detailed videos that cover all the other features. Uh, but hopefully this is something I may even try to make it like kind of required watching for new customers. Um, because obviously you and I both want everything to go perfectly smooth. It keeps my support low and it keeps you happy. So, um, but yeah, so I hope you enjoyed the video and uh, good luck timing and reach out to me or the users group if you have any questions.